Yeah, I'm happy to take that. I think one of the things that um, people are starting to get familiar with now is the umpire's call, and I understand the question and that you know the ball can be hitting the same spot and be, be out in one situation and not out in another. But I think it is you know it, it is an umpire decision review system. So we we are it, the starting point is not an absolute was the ball hitting this particular spot or not. It is about whether that umpire's decision should be overturned. And I think that when it came in, it was, uh, it was much about the way the, the game had been umpired historically, and that um, you know, balls that, are, that were around the margins of the stumps had been given the benefit of the doubt, generally. And that if you, um, and that when, we, when the protocols were developed for, for DRS, it respected the way that umpires had historically dealt with those decisions. So that's why it's, that's why it's remained. Uh, and I think the, the cricket fans around the world are starting to understand or have, un have understood the umpire school reasonably well now. I don't think it's correct to say, well, I, I'm sure that uh, a lot of bookmakers like T20 cricket, but I don't think it's necessarily correct to say that increasing the number of T20 matches will increase the risk. The bottom line is that the T20 format has attracted new fans and more fans. And with more people following the game, the bigger the, the risk that there could be uh, efforts to, to corrupt those matches. So it's an indirect uh, uh, relationship between T20 cricket and the increased risk. But certainly our priority is increase the number of fans. If that so happens that Alex has to work a little bit harder, well, that's just, uh, we have to live with that. Uh, my point was not that T20 attracts corruptors, but the explosion of T20 events, including some private events, and I mentioned some events that are designed for the whole purpose of corruption, has presented a new opportunity to corruptors. I think they do think it's an interesting format in that you might be able to affect a small part of it for a yield from illegal bookmaking or corrupt bookmaking, but I completely agree with David, and I said it in my presentation, the, the expansion of T20 is bringing in more countries, more players, more fans, and is a brilliant development route. We have to get really good at making T20 resistant to corruptors, and as I said earlier, that responsibility also sits with the people who organise T20 events to make sure they've got all the right anti-corruption measures in place. I'd also like it to be in the 2028 Olympics. But the bottom line is we first, we've got no chance of getting cricket into the Olympics unless we are united as a sport. And uh, at this stage we need to convince the BCCI that it is um, a good thing for cricket to be in the Olympics from all aspects. It will generate uh, more fans, more growth of the game, the game will get bigger, it won't uh, uh, prejudice our own, the value of our own events. All those factors we need to be united on and, uh, uh, and then take it forward. We obviously don't enjoy the fact that two members are in dispute with each other. It is a, it is a matter though between India and Pakistan. Um, I suppose our view would be that we would like the resumption of ties on a bilateral basis between <coughs> India and Pakistan, if at all possible, but realize that it is up to them. Uh, to try and uh, make sure that that happens. Other than that, we will facilitate any uh, settlement discussions if we can, but as I said, it's up to the parties themselves to resolve the issue. We have a dispute resolution process which is available for the members to use, and occasionally when they are in dispute, they can make use of that process, which is what the, the proceedings you're referring to uh, are all about. Yeah, I, I, I try to explain it. I, we look um, to link up pieces of intelligence so we look at what, what do we know about this event? Are we providing the anti-corruption cover? So are we already there or is it being provided by another party? Um, are there any other strands of intelligence that we've had about that tournament? Is there anything about the financial backers behind it or the people surrounding the tournament that makes us suspicious? So we never just launch off an investigation because something looks a bit odd on the field or we get a single anonymous report, which we get quite a lot of single anonymous reports, but if you can start putting the pieces together and there's sufficient there that you think there are reasonable grounds to start investigating this, then we would take it on. But our responsibility is for international matches unless we're contracted for another event. So we might look at who are the alleged corruptors in this tournament, so maybe the participants 
are outside, and that's a matter for a domestic board, but the corruptors might be of interest to us, particularly if they also move across into international cricket. And we do find with the corruptors that they will move between formats and international and domestic because they're looking for the opportunity and they're looking for vulnerability. Well, the, the bilateral uh, ODIs will be sorted, I think, to a large extent by the ODI League, the 13 team league. That will create a lot of context in itself. And that will provide qualification to the World Cup, of course. But even in itself, it will create more interest, uh, more understandable interest than maybe the rankings do at this point in time. Um, as far as ODI cricket is concerned, the research shows that it's still an extremely popular format of the game. Uh, I myself love going to a full day's cricket, a day at the cricket is and a 50 over game. Uh, provided it's competitive is compelling uh, viewership. So I think there's a time and place for uh, that format um, and uh, certainly at this stage I'm, I'm confident that it will, uh, the World Cup will remain ever popular and uh, um, it will for many years to come be one of the three formats that we recognize at international level. The two new balls, uh, depends who you talk to. Um, and uh, even sometimes the, the, the same types of persons can't agree. You'll speak to one spinner and he says he enjoys the two new balls because the balls stay harder and they can get more bounce and they get more wickets. You speak to another spinner and he complains the fact that the ball is too hard and it goes too easily for six. So it's very difficult. Um, certainly while we're using a white ball that uh, is made of leather and loses its uh, whiteness, uh, becomes very difficult to see. Reverting back to one ball would be difficult, but I think we've 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 tried to um, mandate uh, people to try and come up the ball manufacturers to come up with a ball that can last 50 overs without with, without becoming invisible to both the players and the public watching or attending the game. Um, ideally, one ball. At this stage, though, I think it's quite difficult to do without two. Yeah, but I I probably have to step uh, as carefully as I did when I first answered that question. There are, there are issues of legality. You know, is somebody in law found guilty of something at a tribunal or not? Has it ever been overturned? There are issues of fairness. If someone's sanction has expired, they are then free to make their services available and it becomes a choice for broadcasters whether they choose to engage them. Now, I've started talking to broadcasters. I want to be much more open about our work and talk to media and journalists more about what we're doing. And I would always encourage them that whoever you employ, whoever you use, is sending a signal. And the corruptors are watching the cricket the same as everyone else is watching it. And is a signal being sent that, oh, it's OK, and a few years later, everything's all right. Personally, I don't like it if I know that someone clearly has been convicted and has been uh, involved in fixing previously and they reappear, you would understand I don't like that. But in law and in points of fairness and the expiry of sanctions, broadcasters are entitled to make their decisions about who they employ.